night after dinner. Mama said. If schools can't always create direct experiences, they can build academic background knowledge by creating indirect or virtual experiences for students through wide reading and direct instruction of content area terms. Wide reading or sustained silent reading to be effective has to have certain characteristics. One is it has to be done over multiple years. Uh, based on my analysis of the research, uh, after one year you probably don't get much of an impact. After the first year, that's when you start to see the impact. So it's got to be sustained over time. Students typically read two, three days, maybe a week, 20 minutes a day, but they don't put the book down and walk away from it. They read, and then they write about what they read, and they talk about what they read. And they're going back to um, their village now. Do you think that his white parents will go back to the Indian village to try to look for him once they realize that he's gone? I don't think they will because He's been really annoying to them, and they just have to, like, keep taking care of him and, like, keeping him from running around. We can encourage students to read things they're interested in, and we're totally cognizant of uh, the guy factor, which is that boys typically are much more interested in nonfiction text than they are fiction, so we try to provide an abundance of nonfiction text in our classroom libraries so that uh, students have access to both informational text and narrative text through read aloud and wide reading. When they read, if they're reading something that they enjoy reading, that they're invested in, they really gain a lot of knowledge about the world. It's like a, an experience for them that they can't get firsthand. And I also think that an important thing about silent sustained reading is when kids choose what they want to read and have the ability to share what they're reading with other students, it really helps them to know more about their world. So why don't you try to sell the rest of the class on Lance Armstrong? Yeah, it was a book we read for a book club, and I just I finished it about two weeks ago, and I thought it was probably the best nonfiction book I've ever read in my whole life. Great. It's, I read it two years ago at the beginning of the year, and it was confusing then because I didn't really understand a lot of the stuff. Okay, good. But now that I've become a better reader and stuff, I understand it better, and I like it a lot more. Okay, good. Um, Tyler? Well, actually, I read a book uh, that Gary Poster wrote, and it's called Brian's Hunt. And I compared it to another book I read called Spear Bear, and uh, I made a Venn diagram, and they both have bear attacks, a bear oh. attacks somebody, and they're both survival stories. You want to get kids to read as much as you possibly can. There's good evidence that... Uh, Kids who read voraciously, you know, uh, have a much easier time with school than, than students uh, who don't. So you want to get kids to read and process that information, talk about that information, write about that information. And if you couple that with uh, direct vocabulary instruction of terms that students will run into in the subject areas that they're studying, you know, you've got a very powerful combination. Wide reading and direct instruction of vocabulary terms both have the goal of installing background knowledge in permanent memory. The research indicates that direct instruction of content area terms is most useful when classroom practices reflect the way the brain naturally learns. Ah, uh, Jennifer has to read fractions. She's reading. Are you sure that's a half? The brain learns best what we choose to pay attention to. The key for teachers is finding ways to focus students' attention on specific learning. Anthony Wagner's lab at Stanford is studying how memories are formed and later retrieved. I essentially try to understand how the brain supports cognition and in particular um, how the brain allows us to uh, learn and remember. It's been known for quite a while that the medial temporal lobe is very important for forming new memories and then being able to reactivate or retrieve those memories and the frontal lobes play a role in directing what information is attended, worked with, elaborated on, and therefore what information gets fed forward into the medial temporal lobes that then can get bound into a new memory. I want you to read that sentence number one and then I want you to tell me what you answered, letter and word. Um, my altimeter read 17,600 feet. D, device to measure altitude. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at Altimeter is actually the pronunciation. Al when students focus their attention on new material, 
They're activating brain areas that can lead to the formation of new long-term memories. What helped you with altimeter? What helped you? What helped you, Zahida? The meter. Meter. Excellent. How did it help? Measure. Measure. Can you think of other words? That if you're trying to teach words to individuals, you're essentially introducing new conceptual information and teaching or allowing the student to form new concepts in long-term memory that then they can use in the future. Elaborating upon the concept, the meaning of the concept, and relating it to other knowledge you have is a particularly effective way of building new memories, essentially storing new long-term representations. Did it trigger anything else? Lisa? Altitude. Altitude. That's a word we're seeing a lot of. Storing new material in long-term memory depends on having multiple exposures to the material, the depth to which we process it and the attention we pay to the details, and the degree of elaboration we engage in or the associations we make to knowledge we have previously stored. But let's try to get some of these words from today's quiz into the visual dictionary, okay? So pull up a visual dictionary. Do you think any of these pictures? This one looks good. You can I see think like, that one's even better than the one we got. Yeah. Oh, you can totally see the trails and stuff yeah. leading to the top of the mountain. And look at that. That's really steep. Mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine myself climbing that. Mm -hmm. The richer and the more varied the memory representation that you form during learning, that is, the more things that become part of the association, the higher the likelihood that the cue that you encounter in the future is going to make contact with that memory structure and allow you to retrieve or reactivate it. Now, our next word is parliament. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the word parliament before. Okay, good. So that's a familiar word to a lot of you. Can any of you tell me what that word might mean, parliament? Travia? It's still got to do with that constitution thing, right? Okay, might have something to do with the constitution. And Some teachers then think if they just teach the words, that's all they need to do. However, the words are only the upper part of what we know about a concept. What we need to do is elaborate the concepts themselves, and to do that takes that more in-depth teaching and a lot of experiences on the part of students. What's an image that comes into our head when we think of the word parliament? Brianna? In that tree that we drew that one day, on the legislative um, part, we like circle it and then point, make an arrow pointing to the United Kingdom. Okay. The research suggests a number of strategies teachers can use to focus students' attention on new concepts. Anderson, why don't you come up and draw your idea? Instead of using a definitional approach with terms, you describe the word. And then have students create their own example, explanation, or definition, if you will. Have students play with words. Have them draw pictures about the words. Have them uh, loop through the words many times, identifying new information that they've learned about the word that they didn't know before. It's something we can do right now in the classroom without adopting a new program. In any learning experience, certain brain areas are more active than others. The more brain areas we can involve in the learning process, the stronger the learning will be. In other research in our laboratory, we've asked the question, what brain circuits are engaged during the learning of different kinds of experiences? The left frontal lobe seems to be particularly engaged during the encoding of words, here in yellow, relative to the encoding of visual uh, uh, stimuli, such as pictures of complex scenes, here in white. The right frontal lobe, by contrast, shows the opposite pattern, greater activation in the right frontal lobe during the learning of pictures relative to the learning of words. The greater the degree to which you engage either or both of these, the greater the, the degree to which you're going to be able to remember word labels, word meaning, and complex perceptual details about an experience. To the degree that we have multiple details stored in memory, that gives us multiple hooks back to the experience. The more information we lay down into memory, the more likely that partial information, if it's part of the memory, will be able to reactivate that memory and allow us to retrieve the knowledge. What is